uh, uh, good uh, evening, everybody. I think it's afternoon there. Yes, after, good afternoon. So um, I've been asked to give you a little introduction about uh, um, the, space, the solar and space weather uh, use cases for LOFAR. Uh, so I made a very generic introduction, a very generic talk. Uh, hopefully it's not uh, too basic. Uh, but let's see how it goes. Uh, feel free to, to interrupt for questions. I think uh, I can still hear you, so uh, this should be fine. I'll try to uh, share the screen. Let's see if it works. Can you all see the presentation? Yes. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, I'm, uh, uh, my name is Pietro and I work in uh, Astron and the Netherlands Institute for Radio Astronomy. Um, I will tell you a little bit about the solar and space weather um, uh, science uh, with LOFAR. Uh, but given that uh, they told me the audience is not really uh, uh, sci all scientific or all in the space weather or solar physics field, I'll, I'll give you a little uh, brief introduction to, to understand why we are um, uh, using LOFAR for this type of studies. Um, I'm sure that already Owen or or Peter this morning have mentioned this uh, as a use case, as a single station, of course. Um, and, uh, and of course, um, much can be done uh, with a single station, but I will focus here in uh, the usage of uh, the full LOFAR array. Uh, let's see. Yes. Okay. So, brief introduction. I think you can see the, the animation. This is the sun. When we think about the sun, we think about, you know, uh, it's all yellow and smooth. Nothing is happening really. But in reality, um, a lot of active, uh, a, a lot of activities happening on the sun. We can see darker region and brighter regions. We can see in this solar atmosphere, a lot of explosions or eruptions are happening. So, um, with satellites, we can observe the solar corona. These phenomena that are called solar flares are nothing more than explosions that happen on the surface of the sun and then they um, um, develop into the solar atmosphere. With different filters, with different wavelengths and instruments, we can observe different temperatures of the solar corona. We can understand the evolution of these um, eruptions that they uh, 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 happen in the sun constantly. Um, what you can see here in these animations are what we call uh, loops or sort of uh, uh, magnetic containers that generate from sunspots, regions where this, the magnetic field is very strong and they appear darker at certain wavelengths. But on top of them, we have uh, magnetic loops that contain hot gas, and then it's constantly uh, firing and, 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 and developing. And, and mo most of this material called uh, uh, plasma, which is hot gas, can be ejected. The reason why this happens is because we can imagine that the sun, it's um, basically um, producing itself a magnetic field. A simple magnetic field, which can be described by normal dipole. So a north and a south pole with magnetic field lines that connect these two poles. This is a very simple uh, approximation, of course, of what's happening in the sun. In reality, the magnetic field of the sun has a cycle, so it varies. The reason why this uh, magnetic field varies is because the sun that uh, contains the magnetic field has what we call a differential rotation. So the equator of the sun spins faster than the polar regions, dragging in all these magnetic field lines, stretching them, and every 11 years, which is the time that we call the solar cycle, these magnetic field lines get entangled, chaotic, stretched, and eventually they emerge from the surface, creating these arches that they can interact within each other with this phenomenon that we call magnetic reconnection, generating then explosions. Explosions that are called, for example, flares or coronal mass ejections. When this happens, you have a lot of material that is ejected from the sun and it can be then, uh, uh, can, can then arrive on Earth. Just to give you an idea of why this is important, you can see, for example, 
that's one of these magnetic field arches. And at the basis of this arch, you can see the sunspots. So if we plot the number of sunspots, so the number of these black spots that we see, with the respect of time, you can see on the bottom plot that this has a, a time um, cycle of about um, uh, 11 years. And uh, this is uh, what we call the solar, the solar cycle. So it's all connected really with the magnetic field. Now, the final part of the introduction is then how this can affect us. Well, from solar physics, for what I was telling right now, so studying, for example, the evolution of the solar cycle or how the solar behave, we then connect to space weather. So the impact of these explosions and eruptions on us, on Earth, and on our technology and infrastructure that is vulnerable to these events. So again, when a, when a CME, a big blob of gas, travels into space, can eventually uh, um, arrive on Earth. When it arrives on Earth, it can interact with the magnetosphere. So, not only the CMEs can actually interact with us, but the solar wind itself, a constant stream of particles coming from the sun. We are lucky enough because we are protected by a magnetic field umbrella that en uh, basically envelops the Earth and protects us from these particles. These magnetic field lines are stretched towards one direction due to the action of the solar wind itself. And these magnetic field lines wobbles and protects from these uh, particles. We can give an example. For example, Mars, our neighbor planet, has a very weak magnetic field. And because of that, the action of the solar wind and the coronal mass ejection have striped out most of the atmosphere. In fact, for example, Mars has an atmosphere that it's only 1% the density of what we have on Earth. We have to go to 35 kilometers above our Earth's surface to find the same density that you find at the basis of Mars' atmosphere. So this is why it's important to protect from space weather, to understand space weather phenomena, because they can really interact with us and our technology. Of course, beautiful result is the northern lights or southern lights or auroras. And this is due to the interaction of these particles, the solar wind or coronal mass ejections, with our magnetosphere. Two regions of the magnetosphere allows the particle for reaching low down in the altitude of our atmosphere. And these are the north and the south pole. Two regions that create what we call aurora ovals, not only uh, a simple point, but a circle around the North Pole that uh, can basically show these spectacular, uh, fantastic shows of uh, glowing light that we can see. Oxygen shows glows green, for example. Nitrogen can glow red and blue. So this is really a very uh, visible impact of um, really a space weather phenomena. So the sun impacting us. Of course, not only we can have uh, impacts on uh, the atmosphere like that, glowing and creating beautiful results, we can also have problems for technology. In particular, again, a CME happen, can arrive on Earth, of course, and, uh, and of course, interact with, with, the, with the solar atmosphere. But, uh, this is the, the right slide, sorry, but also uh, can impact uh, with uh, technology. Now, one of the um, um, things that allows us to understand when these coronal mass ejections are happening are, of course, a uh, coronograph. So we can see here an example where we have an occulting disk at the center and we have a lot of coronal mass ejection coming. Um, again, uh, coronal mass ejection can increase the amount of, of, of northern lights, for example, or glowing lights. But, uh, and this can be called the first space weather events in history, is the Carrington event in 1859. A very huge solar storm happened. Aurora's northern lights were visible down to the Caribbean for the strength of the intensity of this event. At that, at that moment, technological society wasn't so advanced, of course, but still uh, operators at telegraphs were electrocuted by the currents that were produced because of that. Uh, 
devices like telephones, smartphones, computers, GPS, and where a lot of the um, technological infrastructure such as, for example, uh, GPS and airplanes and power grids are really, really vulnerable to these um, storms. So we really need to uh, monitor, understand how, what the sun is doing and try to forecast, to predict the impact of that. And here's where LOFAR comes. LOFAR can help us to understand these uh, storms. Now, LOFAR, you all know, is a network of radio telescopes developed uh, in uh, Astron in the Netherlands. The, the core is uh, located in a region in the north of the Netherlands called Drenthe. Called Drenthe. It's uh, um, the core of uh, LOFAR uh, has about um, a diameter of uh, three uh, or four kilometers, uh, but the Super Turp, the very central island, it's about 300 meters, and it contains two types of antennas, of course you know that, LBA, low band antennas, and HBA. What we do is that we record the signals from these antennas, not only from uh, the Netherlands, of course, but as you can see in the top right, the extension of uh, the, um, and, and, and now in the animation, the number of, of, of stations really span across Europe from Ireland to Poland, Latvia now, which is not included in this animation yet, sorry about that. Um, and then in the future, we will have, of course, Italy that will join uh, the ILT consortium um, in, in about one, one or two years. Um, recording the signal and the radio waves that come from the solar atmosphere or from the solar, uh, say, um, eruptions, we can then understand uh, how uh, uh, this space weather phenomena or the sun itself work. Right. So this is the super turp. Uh, you will know about it. Um, it counts about uh, six stations in this very central part of LOFAR. Uh, they are all, um, uh, let's say, densely uh, displaced in the central part because it's the important part where uh, we need the short baselines, they're called. Where we need that the distance of the stations is small enough and dense in the center to get a pretty image, basically, of the sky and of the sun in particular for this case. Here is the uh, full map where Medicina, the Italian station, uh, will uh, join soon. And hopefully here, I add a yellow dot there, <laughs> we will see uh, one coming up in uh, Bulgaria. Hopefully you all hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. So, quick information about LOFAR before going to some more detailed uh, study about uh, solar and space weather with LOFAR. LOFAR is a software telescope. It's a very complicated telescope. It can record an enormous amount of data. And in fact, if you combine the flow from all the antennas of the ILT station for a specific observation, so filtering only for the target of that specific observing campaign, we can reach data uh, flows of about two uh, terabyte per second, 1.7 terabyte per second. And if you record really everything, even at a station level, what we call these transient buffer boards, you can get even a terabyte uh, per second in a single station only. So it is a challenge. You need to transport this data at very high speed to the correlator. Cobalt uh, is the name of our correlator. It, uh, it is based in Groningen, in the north of the Netherlands. And then from this supercomputer based on a graphic processor, GPUs, everything gets combined together from the different stations, including the international stations, and then sent to our production cluster, which is called SEP4. It is again here in Groningen. And this one basically produces the different data outputs that we need for the different um, uh, case studies. Just uh, an idea of the amount of uh, storage that now we have for LOFAR. This is actually not updated. It's not 28 petabytes. It's already something close to 33, 34 petabytes uh, as uh, the last cycle just concluded. So this is an enormous amount of data. It's a challenge to store it and an 
uh, science that we do. I will focus today on the solar physics and space weather uh, case. We have these, oh, they're called key science projects. These are teams of scientists and researchers that uh, focus on a specific area of interest. So the solar and space weather KSP recently met in uh, Astron, a lot of uh, uh, young researchers and uh, more expert senior researchers met together to um, really use all this uh, data that we recorded from LOFAR. Um, why is the radio in, in, uh, observ uh, why are radio observations so important for the sun? I don't want to go into big details, but what I want to show you here is a little cartoon of these magnetic loops that I showed you before in the animation. What's happening there is when a solar flare happens, you accelerate particles, and with these particles, of course, a lot of electrons. Electrons can glow, for example, in microwave, like the loop that you see there down on the left, uh, but also um, together with these loops of um, uh, particles that glow at a microwave, you can have uh, radio waves emitted at lower uh, frequencies, like meter wavelengths, like the one that we observe with LOFAR. The cases are two. Sometimes you have electrons that stream out in open field lines very fast, and these generate what we call type 3 radio bars down uh, right there in the spectrum. So they are features that are very fast drifting. But then you have shocks, shocks that are generated by this uh, coronal mass ejection, this blob of plasma that travels fast, generates a shock, and then as the plasma, uh, as the, 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 the the material there becomes more tenuous, more uh, less dense, you can get this drift of these radio bursts, which are called type 2 radio bursts. So this is the dynamic spectra from the sun. But with LOFAR, we can also get not only the spectrum, but the image itself. Here you can see an example of the sun at 60 megahertz, where a coronal mass ejection or a flare was happening. So we can study with LOFAR many, many aspects of the space weather scenario. The sun itself, when the reaction happens, where all these beams are accelerated. Uh, so, uh, importance for, of course, also particle physics, theoretical plasma physics, and etc., but also understanding how the sun works. We can also see the heliosphere. So, when the CME, when this blob of material is ejected, we can study the CME embedded on it by studying other pool, uh, sources, such as pulsars, which are stars, which are very polarized in the um, emission, but also quasars, very compact sources. By studying these sources with LOFAR and understanding how the CME modifies the line of sight, so they're, they're uh, basically uh, how the CME passes in front of these uh, sources, modifies uh, the properties of the sources, and from this modification of the properties that we observe, we can understand the CME magnetic field, but also the solar wind speed and density, but not only, also properties of our own ionosphere. So LOFAR is really complete in this sense, it gives us a, a, a full 360 degree view of uh, the space weather environment. Uh, we have a LOFAR current campaign that it's going on, Every uh, time that this new satellite uh, uh, called Parker Solar Probe arrives close to the sun, so it does or elliptical orbits that um, uh, repeatedly every several months go uh, to what we call the perihelion, so when the, when the orbit is very close to the sun. At the time that Parker Solar Probe arrives close to the sun, we start observing the sun, the heliosphere and the ionosphere with low far. And during this campaign, we recorded many data sets. This is an example. Um, one of the recent advantages is that we can perform simultaneously two observing modes. One is called the tidal ray beam. So basically, we create pencil beams, little beams of, or you can say little radio eyes, observing the sky in different locations all around the sun. Another is, of course, by just recording the visibilities, but by just recording the information of all the stations and then performing what we call interferometry. So uh, basically just 
doing some mathematical uh, function that I'll call inverse Fourier transform, we can get an image. This is just to show you how these uh, different um, uh, observing modes are um, comparable and they have, of course, different properties. I don't go into details. What we need to know, though, is basically simply that if you use the international stations or, sorry, let's say the remote stations, first of all, you have a better resolution. So the longer is your baseline, and that's why it's important to add stations such as, for example, um, uh, the international stations. The more information we have at long baselines, the better resolution we can get. Indeed, for the sun, let's say it's a case where we need about up to 30 to 40 kilometer baselines information. After that, probably everything gets, we say, scattered. So the solar corona itself like enlarges the sources so we cannot get the details. Nevertheless, the remote stations are very important up to say 40 kilometers. And with this high inf uh, detail information, we can get better um, estimation of the source, where the radio source is generating, and therefore understanding better how the solar flare or the radio burst uh, propagates and develops to give us a better scenario and forecast for space weather. This is an example, a comparison between Nancy radioheliograph and LOFAR. Nancy radioheliograph is an instrument that was operating up to 2014. Unfortunately, at the moment, it's not operating. Hopefully, it will back, uh, operate back in the future. But nevertheless, this was a radioheliograph. It was dedicated to observe the sun, but it had a baseline of only about three kilometers. Uh, here it's a comparison uh, of in the middle, you can see an image with LOFAR of the same event. You can see how when during one of these uh, radio bursts, which we call type 4, we can see two sources. We can discern from, uh, uh, for example, what Nancy would see, a single big large blob with, with baselines the remote baselines we can see and uh, um, with high resolution we can differentiate for these two sources. So that is very important to understand how um, these uh, storms propagate. Another thing that we can do with LOFAR, of course, is to understand the fine structures that are coming from these radio bursts. This is a current, a recent example. Uh, it's called a type 3B pair. So what it is, is basically a very zoomed in version of a type 3, where you can distinguish the fundamental and the harmonic emission. I want to just point to you your attention here on the number of subbands. If you see in the plot, the number of subbands that we can Im image is uh, so that we can get some images from. It is really fantastic. We can get frequency resolution of several uh, or, or, or some, some hundred kilohertz. So for every subband, we can get an image so we can track the solar radio burst from its origin into the UDSV. And look at these images on the right side. Here we can see images at 30, about, about 26 megahertz or 40 megahertz. And look at what we can see. The details that we can see at these frequencies are really uh, fantastic. This allows us to, to allow us to understand the propagation of these storms from the sun into the heliosphere. I also want to uh, give, uh, give your attention on the fact that we have calibrated images so we can see uh, brightness temperature. We have really the flux that it's coming that, uh, from the source. So uh, this allows us to understand a lot of the properties of the physical mechanism that is generating it. Allow, uh, and, and, and so it's, it's very important for space weather studies. This is again an animation where we can see this uh, type 3 uh, radio burst being generated from this active region. Uh, finally, because I don't want to take a lot of time, I will tell you just a little bit about the sensitivity of LOFAR. This is a comparison between uh, what was recorded during this campaign with LOFAR and what was recorded uh, with uh, a set of instruments called Callisto. They're very small receivers for space weather purposes. But look at the difference. With these small receivers, we can see only the very strong radio burst. In this case, at about uh, uh, 1257, uh, we can see a type 3 radio burst, which is stronger. 
actually, for example, with LOFAR, we can see uh, already um, ab about an hour before uh, the beginning of this storm. So again, the importance for not only studies uh, of these sources for physical uh, reasons, but also for space weather purposes. Final thing, it's about these very faint and small features called, uh, for example, S-bars. These are, these are fine structures that we can find with LOFAR, and they are very, very tiny in terms of duration, milliseconds. In, so they're really, really small, but with LOFAR resolution, both in the spectrograph that it is in imaging, we can uh, understand them better. And also find properties such as, for example, uh, how they modify because of the different den density properties of the corona. To finish, I want to show you a tool that uh, we developed uh, with the, the student uh, that he was working with me. It is a tool that, we, um, that allows uh, the researcher to download a preview file, not the huge amount of files that you usually download with LOFAR, but a very small file, about 30 megabytes, that contains a preview of the, uh, of, the, of the image. It plots the dynamic spectra and then you click on it and you can see already a preview of the tide array, which is an imaging uh, technique uh, that, uh, that I was telling you before. So the, 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 the scientist could briefly, and, or the forecaster, for example, briefly understand where the source is with a small file. And we're, we will try to put this into the LOFAR uh, solar um, observations so that you need to download just a small file and not a huge amount of files to get a preview. And then, of course, to produce the science, you will have to download then uh, the data. But at that point, you will be sure that you are interested in that particular observation. Um, Okay, the final thing is about shocks. This is a recent observation about uh, type 2, so it's a shock in the solar corona. You can see that uh, LOFAR could image this shock at different frequencies, and it was uh, these frequencies were basically um, di disposed along the shock uh, front um, uh, as the CME was propagating. Let's summarize some concepts. So LOFAR is a great instrument for solar physics and space weather. Uh, it allows us to understand how the sun works with uh, an unprecedented uh, precision. And um, it also allows us to understand how these solar eruptions affect us. Uh, so the space weather uh, studies. The KSP and the LOFAR team is now working towards an easy access data uh, policy. So in order also to enlarge the user community and the people using LOFAR for, uh, for this. So thank you very much for your attention.